my feeble presentation and wrap it up and present it to this body of believers in just the way heaven desires it. And may Jesus be glorified in the end. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Revelation chapter 3. We'll be uh, looking at verses 14 through 22 of Revelation chapter 3. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. You know, uh, the title to this set of passages It's called the lukewarm church. And we've just seen here in this passage that God would prefer us to be the hot church or even the dead church because He knows what to do with that. He knows where you stand. But God has message to His last day church is about our spiritual condition. You see, we're not just another church. We were born a movement. God's movement for His last day people. And God desires for us to awaken out of our slumber out of our lukewarm condition. And so this morning, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I will try to help dissect this counsel that God gives to His last day people. There are several points to note in this very important message to God's present day church. First, He gives it because He loves His church. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He gives this counsel because He wants those in Laodicea to be saved and ready for Christ's return. And this is important because those in Laodicea who don't change will be indicted by the words, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's some pretty harsh words. But it's true. Because it it tells you what this lukewarm condition does to our God. 
it makes him sick. Second, he clearly describes their blindness to their unspiritual condition. He knows their attitude about themselves. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods, I have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Those in Laodicea are actually living in a wretched and miserable, sinful condition. They are spiritually poor. They're destitute of the precious fruit of the Spirit. They are totally blind to their condition. Thinking that they are really a great Christian. And they're doing God's will and they're doing His work. And finally, they are naked, standing before God in their own self-righteousness, which is totally unacceptable condition in which to appear before God. However, with this severe message, God also gives the solution to the latest in Christian spiritual problem. So all is not lost. There is hope. The solution to the problem is actually given in reversed order in this text. His last counsel is, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. This counsel in reality presents the first step in coming out of the latest in condition. Let Christ into your life. That's the first step. It seems that even though those Christians in Laodicea think they are upstanding Christians, the truth is that Christ is absent from their lives. He is more or less on the outside of their lives instead of living fully within them. So how do they let Christ into their lives? And the answer is given at the end of the list, what they are to do. They are to buy from God the ISAV. The ISAV is the Holy Spirit, especially the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is by daily experiencing this infilling of the Holy Spirit that Christ most fully lives in the Christian's lives. Jesus taught this when He said in John 14, Verses 16 through 18. I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. And even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. In these verses, Jesus gave His disciples a wonderful promise. He said that the day was coming when the Holy Spirit would not only dwell with them, but would be in them. And then He said, I will come to you. The promised coming of the Spirit was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. On that day, all who had prayed for the promise were baptized or filled with the Spirit. As a result, from that day on, where Jesus was available to live most fully in each believer by daily receiving this infilling of the Spirit. Hence, the first step in coming out of Laodicea is to understand and experience this infilling of the Holy Spirit every day. In this manner, Christians will see their true spiritual condition and begin growing into the fullness of Christ. You see, the, the worst thing for a Christian is to be sick and not even recognize it. 
I'm not talking physical sick. I'm talking spiritual sick. So that the first step in coming out of unspiritual latency in condition is to let Jesus into our lives by daily experiencing this infilling of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus lives most fully in the life through the Spirit's infilling, there's power there. And when we're filled with the Spirit, we have the strength that Jesus desires to give to each one of us. The infilling of the Spirit also opens a Christian's eyes to their sinful condition and leads to a deep sense of repentance for their sin. People's sense of their unrighteousness will lead them to seek Jesus for forgiveness. You see, those in Laodicea don't believe they are really all that sinful. If you ask whether they are sinners, they would, of course, say yes. Everyone sins. Everybody's a sinner. However, it wouldn't be heartfelt. Instead, it would be more of an intellectual attitude because the Bible teaches that all are sinners. But it's important that the Christian comes to the point where they sense their deep need of forgiveness. And without God's Spirit convicting them, this doesn't take place. You see... You can't say I'm putting away sin when I keep it close by me on the shelf where I can get to it. An alcoholic can't overcome if there's alcohol in the home. The wrong kind of music the wrong kind of movies. You don't overcome that when your shelf is stocked full of those things. You must come by the convicting of the Spirit to the point where you sense your deep sense of the need of forgiveness from God for everything that taints your life. And when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. John 16, verse 8. The more deeply people are convicted of their sinfulness, the more deeply they will feel the need of forgiveness. The more people feel their own sinfulness, the more they sense their own unrighteous condition before God and the more they realize their unworthiness of eternal life. You know, we are sinners. And what we deserve is death. Because the wages of sin is death. But we have a loving God who desires for something more for us. He desires to spend eternity with each one of us. And oh, by the way, He gives each one of us the choice. The more that we realize our unworthiness of eternal life, we know deep in our hearts that all we deserve from God is death. Jesus illustrated this one time in a parable about a man owing another man a certain amount, and a second man owing the same man a much larger amount. We find this story in Luke 7, 41 and 42. The man who was owed the amounts forgave each man's debt. Jesus then asked, which man would love the money lender the most? The answer was, of course, the man would love the most who was forgiven the most. The man who owed the greatest debt was released from that debt. 
It is the same with the Christian. Those in Laodicea who believe in their hearts that they are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing will find it impossible to truly love God because they don't feel the deep need of His forgiveness and Christ's righteousness to cover their unrighteousness. It's not to say that they feel that they have never made a mistake. No, they, they have. And at times, uh, known that they have sinned and they have asked for forgiveness. However, it wasn't a deep sense of how truly sinful they are. That is why God included in His counsel to the Laodiceans to be zealous, therefore, and repent. Verse 19. The word translated as zealous can also be translated as eager. It means a deep sense of urgency. The only kind of conviction of sin that will cause a deep urgency to repent is a sense of how repulsive sin is. And that sin brings sadness to the loving Heavenly Father by the disregard of His will. This is why the first step in coming out of latest sin condition is to be filled with the Spirit, the eye salve, which will begin to lead to a sense of deep repentance for one's sinful unworthiness before God. This will then cause the repentant ones to be zealous, to ask for forgiveness as the various aspects of their sinfulness are revealed to them over time. They will appreciate as never before the great sacrifice Christ made for them on the cross and they will feel totally unworthy of His sacrifice. So how is it with you, my friends, this morning? Do you feel your need for forgiveness? 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have the recipe, friends, to find forgiveness. But it's, it's more than just asking for forgiveness and confessing those sins. It's a complete turning away from that. Turning away from that old life and walk forward in newness of life. That's what God desires for His last day church. First John 5, 11-13 says, And this is the record that God has given to us, eternal life. And this life is in His Son, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. That ye may know that ye have eternal life. All we have to do is believe on God and trust in Him that He will do what He says He will do when we will do our part by confessing and turning away, by being filled with the Holy Spirit, by being zealous for repentance in faith, confessing their sins and unrighteousness, accepting God's forgiveness and eternal life through belief in Jesus as their Savior. Believers also cling to the promise that they are now clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness instead of standing before God in their nakedness or unrighteousness. And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Philippians 3.9 They receive by faith the white raiment of Christ, justifying the righteousness by buying it from God. This is zealous repentance and 100% surrender and commitment to Jesus Christ. So where are you, church? 
Where is your heart this morning? What is your desire this morning? Are you comfortable in Laodicea or are you ready to come out and be hot for God? When people receive the eye salve of the Spirit, they sense their sinfulness and need to be justified before God in order to receive freedom from the guilt and penalty of sin. They experience a deep sense of repentance and love of God for His great mercy that was granted to them. When you confess your sins and you feel that forgiveness coming into your life, it's freeing. It's like a weight has been lifted off of you. And you're free to worship God and to dwell in His presence. Because you're standing before God, not in your unrighteousness, but in the perfect righteousness of Christ, clothed in His righteousness. The ice half of the Spirit's infilling also leads them to realize their utter helplessness to overcome their sinful desires. You can try hard to obey God, but it's not in your power to do so by yourself. You must have the Spirit's help. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, looking at verses 18 and 21 through 23. Listen to what Paul describes here in Romans 7 about this experience with sin. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. In these verses, we read of a converted sinner who truly wants to obey God's law. In fact, in his heart, he delights in God's law because it's a law of love. Not a law of do's and don'ts, but a law of love. And if it's followed in the spirit that it is given, it will bring you peace. In fact, in his heart, he delights in God's law. However, no matter how hard he tries to turn away from sin and obey God's law, he experiences the law of sin, or you could call it sinful nature. bringing him into captivity to his sinful desires. You know those things that plague you. They come up over and over again. The devil doesn't have to use new temptations for you because you're still trifling with the old temptations. And this terrible inward struggle with sin causes him to cry out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Verse 24, then in relief he exclaims, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Verse 25, the Holy Spirit was writing God's law in Paul's heart, giving him the strong inner desire to obey God. Just as God wrote the Ten Commandments on the tables of stone, so also the Spirit writes that same law of God on the heart of the Spirit-filled believer. You want God's law, His perfect law of love, written into your heart, then you've got to be a Spirit-filled believer. The Spirit-filled Christian's life is a process of becoming more and more like Christ. 
but we all with open face, beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The eye salve of the Spirit opens the understanding to the total impossibility of overcoming sin by simply trying hard to gain the victory. Once that truth is realized, then the Spirit-filled Christian realizes that he or she must look to Christ for any victory over sin in his life. It's a partnership. It's not... I pull up my bootstraps and do it myself. You know, this is a do-it-yourself world. We don't call the professionals anymore. We, we do it ourselves, and we hope we get it right. Well, friends, we can't do that with our spiritual life if we want to have eternal life. The eye salve of the Spirit opens the understanding to total impossibility of overcoming sin. Once that truth is realized, then the Spirit-filled Christian realizes that he or she must look to Christ for every victory. Our text this morning that Devin read for us, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, talks about laying aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us and run with the patience the race that is set before us. Looking to who? To self? No. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We've got to give up on self and start trusting in our dear Savior to save us. When a person accepts Christ as their Savior, the sinful person is crucified with Christ and buried with Him. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Romans 6, 6-8 through because of this spirit-filled Christian no longer has to be controlled by his or her sinful nature and desires. How does such complete victory over temptation happen? It is through the baptism of the Spirit that Christ most fully lives in the believer. When the temptation of sin comes, he knows what he needs to do. A Christian gains the victory by turning his or her mind away from the temptation and asking Christ to give him or her the victory. Right then. Not after you've trifled with the temptation, but right then when it first pops up. Paul describes this in this way. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Galatians 2.20 Paul lived the victorious Christian life by faith in Jesus. That's the only way. That's our only hope, friends. This is why Paul could write... Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6, 11 through 14. So friends, the bottom line is this. Those who heed God's counsel to buy the white raiment 
of Christ's sanctifying righteousness, which is victory over sin, will come out of their latest sin condition and be enabled through Christ to experience the gold of faithful and loving obedience to God. So friends, I ask you this morning, are you ready to buy the white raiment? I pray that the answer that you give individually will be a resounding yes. Yes, I will buy that white raiment. Yes, I want victory over sin. Yes, I want to come out of the latest sin condition that I find myself in. This is God's message to His last day church. So I'm asking, on behalf of heaven, what is your answer to Him? The everlasting glory of the two while we're going home. In a little while, in a little while, we shall cross the billows fall. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are gone. In a little while we're going home. We will do the work that our hands may find to do. In a little while we're going home. And the grace of God will our daily strength renew. In a little while we're going home. In a little while, in a little while, we shall cross the billows home. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. For some weary way In a little while we're going home And may loving hearts spread around our influence sweet In a little while we're going home In a little while, in a little while We shall cross the billows wall we shall be that lands when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. Beyond there's relief from every care. In a little while we're going home. And no tears shall fall in that city bright and fair In a little while we're going home In a little while, in a little while We shall cross the billows fall We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are in a little while we're going home. Loving Father in heaven, we have looked this morning at the spiritual condition of our hearts. 
And we see, Lord, that this lukewarmness that is described in Revelation 3, those who stay in this condition makes you sick. And you have said that you will spew us out of your mouth. Oh, Father, we recognize our spiritual condition this morning, and it is my prayer that it's the hope and prayer of each one within the sound of my voice understands that and will seek the ISAB, the white raiment that will restore us because in a little while, Jesus is coming. Soon and very soon, Jesus will split open the sky and the dead in Christ will rise first and those of us who remain will together be caught up in the air to meet Him in the air where we will live forevermore in a place where there is no sorrow, no death, no destruction, no sinful, evil habit. Oh Lord, we want to be part of that number. So may we rededicate, recommit, not 50%, not 80%, but 100% sold out to Jesus Christ is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen.